Uh, good evening. Uh, my name is Tom Farmer, and I'm PUD3 Commissioner. I represent the north end of the county. And I'd like to welcome everybody here, and, uh, and thank you for coming. I really appreciate it. Uh, before I introduce uh, Congressman Derek Kilmer, I'd like to thank uh, Derek for his work on our behalf in Congress. Uh, he's uh, been a, a good advocate for us and uh, for education, jobs, the economy, veterans issues, senior issues, and the environment. So everyone, I'm pleased to introduce to you Congressman Derek Kilmer. Um, so, for those who um, have been in one of my town hall meetings before, uh, they will know that I always start uh, my PowerPoint in the exact same way, which is um, with a cute picture of my children. Um, that's uh, Tess, who's on the left, and Sophie, that's on the right. Um, that's before we went to go see the new Star Wars movie, which I confess they've now seen three times. But, uh, and they really like it. So, but I show you that in part because they're super cute, and in part because they're the main reason I I do this job. It's like I care about what kind of country they grow up in. I uh, want to make sure we're, we're checking a stronger future for them. I want to focus on, on really uh, three areas uh, over the course of this conversation. First, I want to just kind of give you a lay of the land on some of the challenges our country is facing. And in particular, I'm going to talk about just some of the economic uh, realities that, that, that we face here in 2016. I'm then going to do a deep dive into the economy and on uh, some stuff that Congress is getting done and some things that I'm working on and things that I want Congress to get done. And then I'm going to wrap up by talking a, a bit about how we get this government back on track because frankly, our ability to make progress for the economy or for a whole lot of other issues is currently somewhat hamstrung by some of the dysfunction in, uh, in Congress and I've got some thoughts about that I'll share with you. So let me start on, on just some of the challenges that we're facing. So the good news is if you look in the aggregate, um, a lot of the economic trends nationwide are heading in the right direction. You've now seen 71 straight months of consecutive job growth. You've seen a decline from the uh, low point of the Great Recession. You've seen a decline in unemployment. Uh, you've seen a reduction in our deficit. Um, the ranks of the long-term unemployed, which is defined as people who've been looking for a job for more than 27 weeks, has declined significantly, and, and uh, all those things are, um, in some respect, really good news. Um, and at the same time, we, we know that uh, particularly the middle class is really getting squeezed right now. We know that a lot of those positive economic indicators haven't been felt everywhere, and that's certainly true in the rural parts of the district I represent, where we continue to face some economic challenges. We also know that even though you've seen job growth nationwide, wages have been pretty flat. Um, and this, what this chart shows is really across every income grouping, um, with the exception of the very most well-off, uh, you've seen wages either stagnant or, or in real dollar terms declining. And that's part of the reason the middle class is getting pinched. Um, in fact, uh, Pew recently came out with a report that said that for, for the first time really in modern American history, the middle class is no longer a majority of the United States. And that's, that's a concern. It manifests itself in other ways as well. Home ownership is, uh, uh, is really struggling right now. We're seeing a substantial uh, amount of uh, student debt, and I'll talk a little bit about that as well. But people, people are feeling pinched. And on top of that, there's a whole lot of things that make everybody really anxious about the economy. Um, you saw, on one hand, gas prices have gone down, which as a member of Congress with a really big district who drives a lot, I'm kind of jazzed about. But at the same time, uh, there are concerns about what, how that exactly plays out over the economy. And you already see many of the states, particularly in the Midwest and in Texas, where you've seen a very steep 
drop in jobs as a consequence of the gas prices coming down. You see that um, the Fed uh, debating what to do with interest rates, and that creates anxiety. Um, you see all sorts of national security concerns from Russia to ISIS, and how that ends up creating instability and uncertainty in the economy. Uh, increased automation is something that um, uh, makes everybody anxious and, uh, and has an impact on job growth. And then um, there's just the dynamic change in our economy. And the be I was trying to think about how best to talk about this. And the best I could come up with was to talk about the Kilmer family's um, favorite uh, places to shop. So I asked my dad, I called my, my dad, I said, what would, when you were my age, what was your favorite place to shop? And he said, Kids Camera, um, Kids Camera in Port Angeles. He would go to Kids Camera to buy his Kodak supplies. And I looked at it, and Kodak actually, at its high point, employed 145,000 people. 145,000 people. And obviously, that's no longer the case. And it's large, in large part because all of us have our own, um, uh, our own camera uh, on our phone now. And uh, you've seen the advent of being able to print our own photos and things like that. And so Kodak is just fundamentally changed as a consequence. Now, when I was a kid, my favorite store was Tower Records. I would go, um, when my, we'd, we'd go to see a Husky football game, we would inevitably stop at the Tower Records in the U District. I would buy something that no longer exists, LP Records, and, uh, and sometimes CDs, which kind of only exist. And now Tower Records is non-existent. And, uh, that is with the advent of iTunes and Spotify and all these things that um, that we never even thought of ten years ago. And uh, my kid's favorite store was Borders. There was a Borders off South 38th in Tacoma. There's one in Gig Harbor. Um, at the high point, there were uh, I think a, a thousand Borders stores nationwide. Tens of thousands of people who worked for Borders, and that was just ten years ago. And now because of everything from the Kindle to Amazon, um, it, it's wiped out. And the consequence of that, if you add up all of that change in our economy, is it creates a tremendous amount of uncertainty and concern, and it causes a lot of us to ask, so what's my place in the economy in 2016? And, and it also uh, begets a lot of, of concern and a lack of confidence. So this is a question that gets asked um, by Pew uh, every year, and, uh, and it's asking about your level of confidence that the next generation will be better off than your generation. And people are decreasingly confident about that. And I think some of the uncertainty around the economy certainly drives that out a bit. And so to me, one of the fundamental questions is, how do we have an economy that works for everybody? You know, how do we see sustained economic growth where there's opportunities for the middle class to prosper from? so that everybody has a place in the economy and can benefit from that economic growth, not just having the growth accrue to the best stock or to places someplace else. Um, I will mention that uh, none of this benefits from the dysfunction in our nation's capital. You've seen everything from a, a government shutdown to a downgrading of our, uh, of our nation as a consequence of the kind of shenanigans in our nation's capital. And, uh, and I will mention that all of that also contributes to uncertainty, particularly in an area like ours. The district I represent, the largest employer, is the federal government. So when you have government shutdowns and sequestration and all that stuff, uh, it, 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 it doesn't help. So let me talk about what I think we ought to do about it um, and how we kind of build that economy that works for everybody. To me, the big enchilada is, uh, is um, is education. Um, I used to work in economic development, actually, with your former county commissioner, John Holder. Thank you for being here. Um, uh, and the number one factor that businesses use when making their location decisions is the availability of good skilled workers. It's number one with the bullet. And what this um, chart shows is that uh, as educational attainment goes up, so do a lot of other things that we like. So. Uh, so does the likelihood that you're employed rather than unemployed, and so do wages. So if you care about unemployment, and I do, and if you care about income inequality, and I do, um, you should care about education and making sure that that door of economic opportunity is open to everybody. 
Um, so I got some, a little bit of good news on this front. You actually saw Congress take action on a big education bill, a bipartisan education bill, uh, toward the end of last year that replaces No Child Left Behind. And the good news is coming out of that is that you, um, uh, you see continued focus on high performance by our students, but much met less micromanagement by the federal government rather than the one size fits all approach that you saw in a really punitive approach that hurt our state that you saw under No Child Left Behind. You saw a bipartisan uh, move away from that. And I think that's, that's really good news. There's a bunch of other stuff I think we ought to be working on. Uh, uh, and I won't go through all of these, but um, one of the big areas I focus on is vocational opportunities and vocational training because, listen, not every job requires a college education. Um, and uh, for a lot of people, the vocational opportunities, both in our K-12 system and through apprenticeships, are really, really important. I'm working on legislation, actually, I just met with our State Board for Community and Technical Colleges, uh, focused on legislation um, that's targeted towards adult learners, uh, what's known as adult basic education, that our community college system does a really good job of, but that they don't get a whole lot of help from the federal government. So we're working on some opportunities in that regard. And then the district I represent has one of the largest populations of uh, service members and military veterans in the entire country. That's a strength for us economically, but one of the big priorities I have is trying to remove any of the barriers that those service members have when they want to enter the civilian workforce. This is a really busy chart, but um, what, I'll, I'll, I'll summarize it for you. The, um, the lines up top show the increasing cost of going to college. And the one on the left is public four-year universities, and the one on the right is, uh, is private four-year universities. And what you see is a very dramatic increase in the cost of education and the cost of tuition. That um, reasonably flat dashed line at the bottom, that's federal financial aid, that's Pell Grants. How many of you have heard of Pell Grants? So Pell Grants help middle class and poor off kids go to college, and adults go to college, and unfortunately, Pell Grants have been really flat. And um, what that means is kids and their families, students and their families are re really getting slammed. And here's how this manifests itself. For the average uh, uh, student now leaving college, their student loan debt, $29,000. And that plays out in a whole bunch of ways in our economy. It plays out in terms of people delaying home ownership. It's part of the reason that home ownership is at a 50-year low. Um, it delays marriage. Uh, and there's all sorts of interesting analyses of these of this. Um, you see a lot more young people um, moving back in with their parents after college, which I confess um, completely freaks me out. Um, it, uh, and it also somewhat limits decision-making um, coming out of college in terms of what, what economic opportunities people have. So, um, so um, I've introduced a bill that's focused on trying to re revitalize the Pell Grant. There's a bunch of things I'm working on with regard to higher ed, but I think this is one of the real big enchiladas. Uh, the main thing it does is it restores the purchasing power of the Pell. So um, in 1985, a student attending a four-year university, the Pell Grant covered uh, about 70% of their cost of going to college. Right now, it covers less than 30%. And so the bill would restore the purchasing power of the Pell Grant. It would enable students to use it for summer school. It would allow Pell Grant to be year-round, which our community colleges are really excited about because, frankly, a lot of their learners are people who are in, in school or, or, or in work and are taking summer classes. And right, right now, there's a limitation on being able to use Pell Grants um, the other thing that I won't go into all this, but I'm happy to talk about more if folks want to when we get to Q&A. Um, the other big thing that it does is it makes the Pell Grant program a mandatory program rather than at the discretion of Congress. Because what we've seen in recent years is when it's been put at Congress's uh, discretion, it doesn't fund it. It doesn't matter what they fund it. Infrastructures are a really big deal. Um, we know that. Uh, I know that having spent um, a lot of I'm stuck in traffic on Interstate 5 today. I'm pretty sure that the speed limit signs um, in many parts of our state are only there for nostalgic purposes. Um, uh, but we also know it because, you know, look, look we saw a bridge go down uh, over the Skagit River uh, just a couple years back. So we know we have infrastructure challenges. And the good news is you actually saw Congress finally step up and pass a long-term transportation bill. 
that's important to cities like Shelton and counties like Mason County because uh, really for the last decade, Congress has only funded transportation three, four, five months at a time. And so if you're, if you're the city of Shelton and you're planning a transportation project and you're wondering, so is there federal, are there going to be federal dollars made available for that? The answer for really the last decade has been, who knows? Um, and uh, it's also a problem for private industry. I did a round table with a group of general contractors and they said, so should we be hiring right now? And should we be buying new equipment? And my response was, I don't know what to tell you because when Congress is only funding transportation three, four, five months at a time, it's the, the uh, crystal ball is very opaque. Uh, so the good news is you saw Congress actually pass a five-year transportation bill. It focuses a lot on issues like freight mobility, which are important to Mason County, um, and being able to get goods to market. And so I'm, uh, I'm excited that we actually saw some progress on that. Um, there's some other things that I'd like to see us do with regard to infrastructure. And I won't, again, I won't go into all of these. Uh, I will mention, and we had a conversation earlier about broadband and trying to expand access to broadband in rural areas and in some of the tribal communities where, uh, unfortunately, the district I represent still ranks in the bottom 20% uh, of the country when it comes to access to high-speed internet. Um, uh, I will soon be introducing a bill that's focused on stormwater, um, and, I, and we're working on that for a number of reasons. One, uh, it's really costly for cities and counties and private industry to comply with stormwater regulations. And the federal government currently isn't much of a partner when it comes to uh, addressing green stormwater infrastructure. So we're working on that to provide basically some more federal assistance in that regard. But the other thing is, that is often an impediment to seeing economic development move forward. And so that's part of the reason it's a priority for me as a, a guy who spent my previous decade before I got into Congress working in economic development. Uh, federal research is a really big deal. We remember Sputnik, uh, where the United States woke up and said, we've got to actually uh, invest in national research. And it begat a whole bunch of extraordinary technologies. The thing I often point to is, again, the cell phone in many of your pockets. Um, and I say that because, you know, the, if you look at my phone, the lithium battery that powers it, the touch screen that allows you to navigate on it, the uh, internet that lets you look up a delicious Mexican restaurant to go have dinner at after this town hall, and the GPS system that helps you navigate your way, all of those technologies, all of the basic research behind those technologies was funded by the exact same venture capitalist, Uncle Sam, by all of you as taxpayers. And, uh, and that has been a benefit to us in terms of new innovations and new jobs. Um, unfortunately, what we've seen since uh, Sputnik has been a steady decline in federal investment in research and development. And that is somewhat to our economic peril as we look to compete with other nations uh, around the world. Uh, you did see a little bit of improvement coming out of what was called the Omnibus, which was the big spending bill that Congress passed in a bipartisan way in December. We saw an uptick in funding for the National Science Foundation and an uptick in uh, funding for the National Institute of Health. Um, at the same time, my hope is that you see greater focus of research on some of the big, hairy problems facing our country. Cybersecurity is a good example of that, where um, we can send you, continue to see threats to, as we sit in a PUD, our public utilities are very concerned about the potential of denial of service and, and cyber attack. Um, you know, our banks are very concerned about constant cyber threat. The other big example of that is, uh, is climate change. and, and Relatedly, ocean acidification. The 3,200 people who live uh, and work in the district I represent, whose livelihoods are tied to the shellfish industry. We know that's a big industry here in Mason County. And unfortunately, they face a threat as a consequence of changing ocean chemistry and uh, the in a potential inability to, to harvest, to grow and harvest shellfish down the road. And so, um, this is something that, uh, in fact, I uh, sponsored a bill with our neighbor and Congresswoman J.D. Rare Butler, a bipartisan bill trying to drive more federal attention and federal resources to this problem of ocean acidification. 
Small business is uh, uh, is incredibly important. How many of you have heard the expression "small businesses are the backbone of our economy"? So I like that. Um, I actually think that's pretty good. I always call them our star running back because if you look at how our nation generally makes it out of recessions, it's not it's not the big guys who are scoring the touchdowns and racking up the tough yards. It's our small businesses that are generally the ones that pull us out of recessions. And I look at one of the roles of your government is at the very least to get the heck out of the way of our star running back, but I think we need to do some blocking and to call some plays for our star running back. And so in my office, and in fact, we just uh, we just uh, visited one of your uh, local businesses here right before I came here, um, we do what we call Kilmer at your company events, which I think is very catchy. Um, <laughs> uh, but we go and we meet with local employers just to get a sense of any challenges they're facing and opportunities that, that we can provide to help grow more local jobs. Because again, we don't have Boeing and Microsoft here in the District of Arizona. We have small business, and I think we ought to be doing everything we can to help those small businesses succeed. Um, you saw some progress in, at the end of the year, again, out of Congress. The, the reauthorization of what's called the Export-Import Bank is helpful to small businesses that try to sell product, American products to other parts of the world that provides financing support to those businesses that seek to do that. You saw a big tax policy bill in December that passed that has several provisions that were targeted specifically at small businesses, things like the Section 179 deduction, which helps manufacturers purchase equipment. Um, so some good stuff that happened at the end of the year. There's a whole bunch of stuff I think we ought to be doing on this front, and I can talk, I can spend two hours talking about this, so I'll try not to. But, you know, I think we still need to look at broader scale tax reform in this country because we have a tax climate that really, I think, disadvantages small Main Street employers in communities like Shelton. Um, the tax code, I think, is uh, more oriented toward, um, we have crazy tax policy. We have tax policies that literally incent businesses to grow jobs overseas. I think we should be encouraging investment in the United States of America rather than someplace else. Um, I can talk about any of these. Uh, I will point out access to capital, and I'll point that out in large part because earlier in the day I was in Tacoma with the head of the Small Business Administration talking about some of their financing programs and the important, important role that they play, uh, uh, play in helping out our small businesses. We visited a manufacturer that does some really cool work, and we're able to do that as a consequence of SBA financing. One of my big priorities has been helping out our rural communities in particular. I grew up in um, Fort Angeles and I worked in economic development largely because when I was a high schooler, our local economy pretty well crashed. And uh, that's motivated a lot of, of my public service and it's motivated a lot of what I work on and what our office works on. So let me give you some of the examples of that. We've been working on trying to help uh, uh, the new burgeoning engineered wood products industry, products like cross-laminated timber, which hold incredible potential for Mason County and for the peninsula uh, more broadly. And that way that manifests itself is, to some degree, a convening role. We were up at Alderbrook and had a giant meeting about cross-laminated timber and engineered wood products to talk about some strategy around that. But also it means, for example, I'm on the Appropriations Committee and we got language in the defense bill last year saying that the Defense Department, which is America's largest builder, should look at using some of these engineered wood products so that we put, so we start to provide some market for it. One of the other priorities for me has been trying to increase in a responsible way the harvest levels within our national forest. I think for too long we've seen this sort of um, battle uh, between industry and the conservation community and it's often ended up in litigation. And um, having lived through that, uh, when I got into office, we stood up something called the Olympic Peninsula Timber Collaborative, which is, or the Olympic Forest Collaborative, where we've got industry and the environmental community at the same table trying to identify how we can increase harvest levels in a responsible way. How we can, um, you know, and the good news is if you do this right, not only does it work for local economies, it works for forest health as well, because there's some initial level of timber harvest that actually promotes forest health, reduces the likelihood of forest fires, reduces the likelihood of insect infestation, and allows trees to grow better. And so 
we've got them now at the same table, and we've actually launched, launched now a couple of pilot projects where we're actually starting to see uh, addition, uh, you know, an additive effect on the harvest levels in the Olympic National Forest. So stay tuned, that's something I'm working on. Um, I won't talk about all this other stuff. Um, a lot of that's focused on some of our coastal communities. I'm more than happy to dive into that in Q&A, but I don't want to spend too much time. To me, the, um, again, I go back to when we teed up the main challenges that we face. To me, it's how do you have an economy that works for everybody? And how do you make sure that the middle class isn't getting pinched right, left, and center? And so a lot of, uh, that's a lot of my focus. You, again, you saw some progress on this front coming out of our nation's capital at the end of last year. Um, I don't know how many of you saw this, but the, the uh, occasionally in recent years, you've seen Washington and those states that don't have an income tax have the opportunity to credit our sales tax payments against our federal income tax. That's, been, that's happened in fits and starts, and in December, the ability to do that was made permanent. And the consequence of that is about a $600 benefit to the average taxpayer here in Washington State. So that's a big deal for middle class families, for families uh, throughout our state. Um, there were a number of, uh, of efforts out of that tax bill at the end of the year to make permanent some really important policies targeted at working families. So for example, the earned income tax credit that helps work pay more than welfare that actually is targeted at working families. The child tax credit is another example of that. Turns out having kids is um, expensive. Uh, and so uh, the child tax credit, again, is a tax policy that's targeted just helping families uh, make it. And I'll, I'm happy to talk about some of this other stuff, but I, I know I'm running a little bit longer than I wanted to. Uh, I've been also working on a number of efforts really tar focused on just trying to help workers. Um, how many of you followed what happened in our state around the Hagen grocery stores? So, uh, I thought that was just dead wrong, that um, people were not only losing their jobs, they were being told you can't go find another job because of a non-compete agreement. Um, a non-compete agreement may make sense if you are you know, have trade secrets at Microsoft, but if you're, a, in many instances, a reasonably low-paid grocery store worker, being prohibited from finding alternative employment doesn't seem right. And so um, uh, I reached out when Hagen went through his uh, uh, bankruptcy. Um, uh, I reached out to the Federal Trade Commission, and thankfully they agreed. And so they um, they greenlit those effective employees to go find uh, alternative employment, including in the grocery industry. But it strikes me that we're we're not going to we may see con continued consolidation in the grocery industry. And so I put forward legislation that says you shouldn't. You shouldn't require, as a means of employment, signing a non-compete uh, non agreement uh, for people who are in, in grocery employment. That doesn't make sense. Um, I'll mention a couple other things on here. I don't know if you saw in the newspaper, uh, uh, there's been a little bit of attention paid to this. H-1B visas are visas where people can come in and uh, from another country and work for an American company. We've seen some abuse in that system where people have been granted an H-1B visa, they've been brought into an American company in the United States, and they've been uh, and an American worker has been asked to train that foreign worker so that that job can then get outsourced overseas. That is not right. That is completely outside the intent of that law, and to me it's an example of what should be an absolutely common sense bipartisan change to our immigration system. And so we've got a bill to do that, to say you cannot use H-1B visas to outsource American jobs, period. Um, and then uh, I'm a co-sponsor of a number of bills that are focused on trying to strengthen Medicare and Social Security. Um, earlier today I called my grandma, who's 105, wow. and uh, who has, uh, you know, did, my grandfather died in 1981. And her ability to live with dignity has really been driven by two of the most successful public policies in the history of the world, Medicare and Social Security. And to me, it's very important that we sustain those programs, not just for current retirees, but for future retirees as well. Uh, I mentioned that a lot of, uh, uh, of the workforce in the region I represent is military families and veterans. 
and I work a lot on those issues. In fact, last week uh, we kicked off a bill, a bipartisan bill that's focused on something that I confess I learned about because I go out and listen to people. I was up at the Naval Shipyard and someone said, did you know that the federal government has a law um, that it was a member of the uniform in terms of Navy sailor? And he said, did you know that I'm prohibited when I leave the Navy from seeking a civilian job with the DOD for six months? He said, basically, I wouldn't be on point for six months before I can apply for a job. I said, I didn't know that. That seems stupid. Um, and so we looked into it. He was right. It's a law that's been on the books for quite some time. Now, interestingly, in recent years, it's actually a law that's been waived uh, by the Obama administration. But unfortunately, later this year, that waiver ends. And so, as we see, a lot of our uniformed military is seeking to enter the civilian workforce. I think it only makes sense that if they're qualified for those jobs, we should make sure that they can apply for those jobs, rather than sit unemployed for six months. And I'm happy to talk about any of this other stuff. So, um, that was a very quick fire hose on economic issues. I will tell you, we can't make progress on any of these things unless we get government working better than it's been working. Um, I am very conscious of the fact that when I got elected three years ago, I joined an organization that's less popular than head lice and colonoscopies, um, <laughs> according to recent um, uh, And I've, having been there now for a little over three years, I've got a pretty good sense of why. Um, you know, I think you've seen way too much uh, partisan bickering and not enough focus on making progress on behalf of our country. And there's a lot of things that factor into that, but I want to talk about at least a couple of them. And one is um, our campaign finance system. Uh, this has gotten worse after a Supreme Court decision called Citizens United, where you've seen really the floodgates of super PAC dollars um, really um, flood into our campaign system. And as a consequence, it means that uh, deep pockets and special interests have too much say in our democracy, and I think that's impeded the ability to make progress on a lot of things that certainly I care about. Um, as a consequence, I've sponsored a whole bunch of bills in our nation's capital focused on this, and I'm only going to talk about a couple of these. One, I will tell you, I do not think that money is speech, and I don't think that corporations are people. And uh, I think the Citizen United decision was a mistake. And as a consequence, I've co-sponsored a constitutional amendment to overturn and undo that Citizens United decision. I will also mention uh, the bottom bullet point. So I confess, I didn't know a lot about the Federal Election Commission. Um, and then I started reading articles about the FEC being almost as dysfunctional as Congress. Um, the Federal Election Commission was set up after Watergate as a independent uh, watchdog to try to enforce campaign finance law. And it worked pretty well for quite some time. And now it's really hit the skids. Um, in large part because of the way it was constructed. It was set up with three Democrats and three Republicans. Does anyone want to guess how every decision of the FEC <laughs> currently deadlocks 3-3, three, three, right? And so, I mean, literally every decision, I, and like every decision, I, in fact, you should Google this. This is not a joke. When the FEC celebrated its 40th anniversary, they had a celebratory breakfast. This is not a joke. The commission uh, deadlock on whether to serve bagels or donuts at the 40th anniversary. <laughs> I'm not kidding. And everyone knows the right answer is donuts. Um, but, uh, but, so uh, coming out of learning about that, uh, I introduced, I'm the main sponsor of the first bipartisan campaign finance reform law since the final goal more than a decade ago to try to put the teeth back in the Federal Elections Commission. And I will tell you the genesis of that. Um, the genesis of it was a group that I'm a part of called the Bipartisan Working Group. It's a group of a little more than a dozen Democrats and a little more than a dozen Republicans that meet each week when we're back in Washington, D.C. to try to figure out how to work together. Um, and we spend the first part of the meeting talking about what we're working on and how we might be able to work on some of those things together. And then we spend the second part of the meeting talking about big, hairy issues facing the country. And um, when I read these articles about the Federal Election Commission, I invited a guy named Trevor Potter to come have breakfast with us. And Trevor Potter, uh, you may have heard of, he was um, John McCain's attorney for his campaign. He was a Republican uh, designee to the Federal Elections Commission, but he has most recently gained fame for being the attorney 
for Stephen Colbert's super PAC, People for a Better Tomorrow Tomorrow. Um, uh, and uh, so Trevor came and met with our group and he started going into all of the details of how dysfunctional the FEC was. At the end of the meeting, I said, this sounds like a real problem that needs solving and I'm willing to work on this. Does anyone want to work, work with me? And we had two Democrats and two Republicans work on this bill together, write this bill together, and introduce this bill together. Now we're working on trying to get it passed together. And that, to me, is the value of the bipartisan working group. I'm now the vice chair of that group. And um, uh, I don't want to mislead you, as I often share with people. I, it's not a group that you know, holds hands and sings that if I want to buy the World of Coke song. Um, we do not close our eyes and do trust falls into each other's arms. Um, <laughs> stop doing that because it was creepy. But, um, <laughs> uh, but it is the sort of hour of my week each week that I'm back there where I find myself thinking, okay, that's how we get this thing back on track. Um, now, before uh, I hand you questions, I want to mention that a big part of what our office does is what we call casework, where we um, help people who might be grappling with a federal agency. And I want to introduce my staff in the back of the room, um, Sherry and Stacia and Nicholas, uh, who many of you may have met. But um, they work with the people I represent. Half of our staff here in the district uh, does casework. And um, some of it's most frequently around the Veterans Administration. And some of the coolest stuff we get to do is when someone has been denied something that they have coming to them um, and work with them to cut through that red tape. And get, you know, I got to stand in a guy's living room and <coughs> pin a purple heart to his chest 40 years after a year. And that's a good day, right? That's just a cool day. And uh, sometimes it's people who are grappling with the IRS or you name it. So I can mention that, so um, if you or someone you know might be grappling with an issue in that regard, please reach out to our team. Also want to put in a pitch, and I think we have on our sign-up sheets out there the ability to say, I'd like to get our get your newsletter. Um, if you don't get it, please get it. I send it out every two weeks. It's the one benefit I get from 11 hours a week on an airplane, because I get to write you a newsletter. Um, and uh, I encourage you to uh, sign up for it. And with that, I'm going to stop the and I'd love to hear what's on your minds and ask what, answer whatever questions you have. Yes, sir. Yeah, I'm not a big fan of the government. Um, I have two issues with the government. Both of them have to do with the way the government operates. One, obviously, is well, One, obviously, is the Veterans Administration. I don't understand why they have to have their own hospitals. But we can just have the veterans here in Shelton, both the Mason General. They should eliminate the whole veterans hospital and do it just like Medicare. Maybe have a veterans administration to oversee because veterans have unique uh, medical opportunities. But to send somebody from Shelton all the way to Fort Lewis or Seattle is idiotic. Just shut down all those veterans hospitals, have them go to Mason General or Providence Hospital or Group Health or someplace much closer. Number two, I've had an opportunity to work very closely, unfortunately, with the uh, uh, FEMA. Um, I sold my house, I lived in a lake. Uh, I had one phone call and I was able to cancel my liability insurance and my fire insurance. Took seven phone calls, four letters in six weeks to get FEMA to shut it down. I wrote them a letter saying I sold my house, I had to provide all kinds of documentation. That is idiotic. And by the way, one last thing, you made, a, made an error. Uh, corporations are not people. Corporations and labor unions are legal persons. There's a vast difference between uh, being a people. I don't like the con the voter, uh, you know, the campaign laws, but everybody keeps thinking they're people. The law says legal persons, and they're both labor unions and corporations. So let me try to hit on uh, each of the issues you raised. Uh, on the FEMA front, um, uh, those are the types of things where if any of you in the audience, uh, that's exactly the type of example where I would invite you to reach out to our office. There are some systemic issues with FEMA and that's also something that we've been working on in areas that, um, uh, that are uh, within the FEMA floodplain. We're actually doing a, a, a big effort right now in Grace Harbor County trying to address the FEMA floodplain issue and try to see if investments can be made at, at the local level to pull more of those residential areas out of the FEMA floodplain so that they don't run into the types of problems 
that you mentioned. I'll also mention one other thing on the FEMA front. Uh, unfortunately, I think rural communities are really negatively impacted by FEMA's current approach. And I say that in large part because whether you're talking about wildfires in central Washington or whether you're talking about flood damage in western Washington, the capacity to qualify for individual assistance under FEMA absolutely sticks it to rural communities in a couple of respects. One, if you're a community, if you're a small community that's part of a larger county, which most of the rural communities are, um, it is almost impossible to qualify. And secondly, because one of the factors is, one of the determining factors is the uh, uh, amount of property damage, well, our property values aren't as high as they are in Bellevue. And as a consequence, it makes it very difficult to qualify um, when we do see a disaster. And so um, I just introduced a bill with uh, Dave Riker and, um, uh, uh, and um, uh, Kevin Morris Rogers uh, uh, from, because they have areas that were negatively impacted by, by the forest fires. So that's, I, 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 we have heard a lot of issues around, uh, around FEMA and those are absolutely things that, uh, that I'm engaging on. On the, on, the, on the VA front, I think, listen, I think the VA plays a very important role and largely be, because, and as you mentioned, there are uh, some uh, issues that veterans face as a consequence of their service, whether it be uh, cancer associated with exposure to Agent Orange or traumatic brain injury um, or post-traumatic stress disorder, where our VA offers, I think, uh, cutting edge and top of the line service. And, and yet, we have seen through the uh, recent years long waiting lists and all sorts of challenges. Um, and listen, our office gets those calls and we always try to help the veterans impacted by it. So where I've tried to engage on that is in a couple of ways. Um, first, uh, I've introduced legislation that's focused on reforms of the Veterans Health Administration. And interestingly enough, even though this bill hasn't been passed into law, we've already seen a part of the bill get action on it. Part of the bill is focused on uh, making a, a number of reforms within the Veterans Health Administration. But one of the things that the bill's call, bill calls for is for the Government Accountability Office to look at how the VA provides service, to look at its mission, and then look at its systems and its staffing levels and how it provides those services to figure out whether it's properly oriented towards doing what it's supposed to do. And even though that bill hasn't been passed into law, we got a call from the Government Accountability Office saying, you know what, that's a really good idea, we're just going to do it. So that's happening now. Um, the other thing, and maybe, uh, maybe um, this has to be your radar screen, the other thing that I've been uh, an advocate for is particularly at a time where we continue to see long waiting lists uh, 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 within our VA healthcare facilities is what's called the VA Choice Program, which enables uh, people who are in proximity to those facilities that have long waiting lists and for people in rural areas that um, don't have proximity to a VA care provider to be able to seek care at their local uh, health care provider. And that is that is now law. Um, and you're seeing, again, as someone who represents, you know, we're here at Shelton. You know, I was out in the Bay and I talked to a group of this, you know, it, it takes us a day to get to American Lake, right? And it's, it's a real haul. And so, um, the capacity to go to your local healthcare provider and be able to still get VA financial assistance to do that, uh, I think, particularly in the near term where we have, we continue to have long waiting lists, I think makes none of that sense. Yes, sir. Uh, we want to thank you for uh, supporting the uh, provisions and the. Uh, want to thank you for supporting the. Passing of the provision to earn the income tax credit, the yeah. child tax credit. There's a uh, proposal to extend the earned income tax credit to pilots workers. Yeah. And I wonder if you could speak to that issue, please. Yeah, you bet. So the, the questions about the earned income tax, did everyone hear it? No. So the, the um, I couldn't tell if that microphone worked. The question was about the earned income tax credit um, and uh, an effort to expand the earned income tax credit to, uh, to workers who don't have kids. And I support that. Um, uh, the, the, so the earned income tax credit basically provides, a, a, in essence, it's, as it sounds, a tax credit for people who are working 
And where and their initial rationale behind it was to make sure work pays. Because for a lot of people, and you pointed out right now the focus on family with kids, the challenge is right now if you're doing the math and you add up the cost of childcare, you add up the cost of getting to work and all of that stuff, to some sometimes the arithmetic just doesn't pencil. And the earned income tax credit is to a large extent intended to try to make sure that work pays more than welfare and that it encourages work and it helps people support themselves and their families. And I am very supportive of that, any effort to extend that to, to more people and make sure that, um, I just think that that is, that is part of our tax code that makes a whole lot of sense. And it's why at the end of last year, you saw bipartisan support to make that tax credit permanent. Yes, sir. Gary, thank you for uh, this wonderful meeting here. You bet. Uh, yeah, I'm a recent uh, Shibuya retiree yeah. and proud of it. Uh, 40 years. My concern is the uh, the middle class. Uh, hopefully, we're going to reach the bottom here with this uh, political revolution that we're coming up with. But the issue I have is with the TPP and the uh, you know overseas uh, exporting of our jobs. Uh, Recently, the carrier is uh, turning over their business to uh, Mexico, uh, using 1,400 jobs. Uh, Huffington Post had an article explaining the uh, you know the profits the company's been making for the last couple of years. It's, it's just really frightening to see how much money the company's uh, made in the billions, yeah. and uh, they're still moving. What is your uh, encouragement on uh, this TPP. Uh, yeah. So, um, I hope you're ready for a long answer. Um, so, uh, the, let me start by giving the context for what we're talking about, since not everyone may know about this. The question was about what's called the Trans-Pacific Partnership, which is a 12-nation uh, trade deal that President Obama uh, negotiated. Um, and uh, to be candid with you, I don't yet have a position on it. I'm still reading it. I'm, it's really, um, it's a really big deal, not just because it affects 40% of the world's economy. It's actually a big deal just in terms of number of pages. Um, and so I'm plowing through it page by page and chapter by chapter. And um, I will say uh, it's, it's a, it is a significant issue in part because it affects 40% of the world's economy. And on one hand, our state has generally done pretty well when we've been able to sell American products to other parts of the world, whether that be Boeing airplanes or Microsoft software or all in Roca made in Tacoma or manufactured wood products or cherries and apples and all that other stuff. Um, we have generally, in our state, been a beneficiary of global trade. And at the same time, you look at some of these prior trade agreements, and I would argue that they haven't lived up to their billing. And um, to me, the litmus test should be, is this something that's gonna help us export American products, not export American jobs? And I would say that I've heard probably um, four concerns about it more than any other, and I'll give you kind of lay a land of, the, of, of those concerns, and then I'll give you a sense of what we're hearing from President Obama and from his administration in response to those, and I'll give you a sense of kind of how I'm weighing this while I'm reading through this big, old agreement. Probably the first issue that we hear about, that I hear about, is around the economic impact. Again, this issue of, um, you know, will this actually promote economic growth in the United States? Um, or, or not, um, and concern that it might lead to uh, jobs going um, someplace else. So the good news is we are actually going to have some kind of unbiased analysis on this. As a re there's a required report out of something called the U.S. International Trade Commission that will evaluate the um, expected job impact of the Trans-Pacific Partnership, and importantly, it will also look sector by sector. <coughs> And so you can kind of, once we get that analysis, which I think is going to come around May, we'll be able to get a sense of, okay, what does that mean to Washington State, right? Because we'll look at what sectors we have and get some um, some sense of that. Because obviously, you know, listen, I 
do this because I grew up in a town where the economy crashed and I don't want to see anything that has a negative impact on jobs and on American jobs. Um, the, uh, I would say the second concern that I hear from people is about um, even if there is economic benefit, uh, where does that benefit accrue, right? Is that to workers or is that to large multinationals? And I think that's a legitimate concern and, um, uh, and that's part of the evaluation process that I'm gonna be doing. Now I will tell you what President Obama uh, says about that. What he says, and, and he's right about this to some degree, so, um, 85% uh, of the companies in the United States that export are small businesses. They're actually not large multinationals, they're small businesses. And by and large, those companies that export, rather than no in comparison <coughs> to those companies that don't export, pay about 15% more in wages. They, they provide better paying jobs. And currently, only about 5% of American small businesses export. And so what what President Obama suggests is if you can remove some of those barriers to American small businesses and enable them to export American products, they'll be able to employ more people and uh, the benefit will accrue to, to us, right, to, to workers. And, um, you know, that was probably, I had a really interesting discussion I visited with a manufacturer in the Nauri Valley of Tacoma and I remember that he was a, it was a union manufacturer. And the guy said, the general manager said, so what do you think about this trade agreement? I said, I don't know yet, I'm still reading it. I said, what do you think? And he said, so, um, he said, we export. And he said, but there are three countries that are currently party to the Trans-Pacific Partnership that we can't even sell into at all. I said, why is that? And he said, those, companies have, those countries have requirements that I sell that I manufacture part of my product in their country. And he said, so, he said, I don't want to manufacture in an Asian country, I want to manufacture in America. He said, so those, those markets are completely off the table. And he said, and then the other countries, I face between a 5 and 25% tariff when I sell my stuff. And he said, so as a consequence, I sell less of my stuff, which means we make less of our stuff, which means we employ fewer people here in Tacoma. And he said, if, if the trade agreement removes some of those non-tariff barriers and some of those tariff barriers, I'll sell more stuff, I'll make more stuff, and we'll employ more people. And so that's part of it. what the administration points to is there's about 18,000 tariffs that either, on American products that either to get eliminated or lowered under this agreement. And so that's part of the analysis I'm gonna do. Um, I've got two more points, but I want to make sure, are you all interested in this? Okay, all right. I, I know I'm going into detail, but it's a really big deal and it actually really matters. And I want to, part of the reason I think town hall meetings are valuable is that even when I haven't made up my mind on something, you can at least get some sense of how I'm thinking about it. Um, I would say the third issue that I hear is about standards and uh, whether there be adequate standards to protect uh, the environment and to protect workers. And uh, people often point to NAFTA as a problem. Now, what the administration says rightfully is there was actually not a labor or environmental chapter of NAFTA. And as a consequence, the, all the considerations around workers and around environmental protection were in the side agreement. And as a consequence, not really enforceable. And um, Democrats in some prior agreements fought for something called the May 10th Accords to establish higher labor standards and environmental standards as part of the new trade agreement. What that means is, the, in the Trans-Pacific Partnership, there's language that says, if you're a country that's party to this agreement, you have to, for example, uh, allow for collective bargaining. You can't be big on, on you know, uh, keeping people from forming a union. You have to have a minimum wage. You have, you, you have to have a prohibition on child labor and forced labor. And all of those things are good. Now, I will tell you, when I talk to some of the folks who are most concerned about this, what they will often say is, the words on paper are actually not bad. Our concern is whether they're actually gonna get enforced. And I think that's a very legitimate issue because I, I think there are legitimate concerns about, you know, particularly when you're not 
We don't know who the next presidential administration will be, but what their commitment will be to enforcing environmental law and labor violations. And so, to some degree, the question for me is, do you have the status quo where right now most of those nations have no standards, right? They, or, or have minimal standards, and they still have child and child labor and forced labor. And as someone who cares a lot about trying to lift people out of poverty, not just in the United States, but all over the world, um, you know, I think that matters, right? So the question is, are we better off with the status quo, or do we take a chance on this in hopes that there's adequate enforcement? And I'm not sure yet. I would say the final thing that we hear about that I get a lot of calls about is what's called the Investor State Dispute Settlement, or ISDS. That sounds super wonky. Um, but what that is, is a, is a means of uh, blowing the whistle on what's perceived as a potential trade violation. And um, what it establishes is the ability to pursue um, a potential trade violation outside of the judicial system. And I confess this is an area that gives me a bit of heartburn. The, and I asked him, I, I will tell you, I was in a meeting with the president and I asked him about this. And what he has said about investor state dispute settlement is that this is less about American regulations. Because America, when it regulates, it doesn't regulate in a discriminatory way. It, if it has clean air laws that apply the same if you're an American company or if you're a Japanese company. Um, that's not true in other parts of the world, right? You have uh, a number of countries where they discriminate, where they do regulations specifically to try to stick it to American companies that are trying to do business in their country. And right now, the primary redress, if you're one of those small businesses in particular, is to sue in the court of that country. Well, good luck, right? I mean, particularly in some of these countries that don't have particularly sophisticated judicial systems. And so what the president argues is this investor state dispute settlement provides a mechanism to challenge it outside that judicial system of that country. Now, my concern is, I think it's very important, I think one of the fundamental roles of government is to regulate in the public interest, to be able to protect us, right? From whether that be to protect consumers or protect workers or protect the environment. And to me, it's important that you maintain that ability to, to, to provide those protections. The administration will point to, there's language actually in it, I just read this a couple weeks ago. Um, there's language that said, you know, nothing in this agreement should limit the ability of governments to regulate in the public interest for worker safety, environmental protection, and consumer protection. And that's paraphrasing. So it says that, but I, I need to understand that better before I go on this. Now, just, that was a really long answer, but um, I, I hope that gives you a sense of how I'm thinking about it. Timing-wise, we probably won't see this at, at earliest because of the rules that were established under what was called Trade Promotion Authority. We can't vote on it until, I think, mid-May. Um, we probably won't vote on it until, I would guess, after the election, event, um, if that. So stay tuned. Sorry, that was a really long answer. But I hope that gives you a sense of how I'm thinking about it. Yes? I have a quick question yeah. with regards to the your education uh, yeah. and your Pell Grant bill. Yeah. I have two daughters, they're in their 20s, they uh -huh. are not living at home. Congratulations. But, <laughs> 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 I, I, I enjoy that, yeah. but they're both college students. Yeah. And you know, fortunately, they actually decided to go back to school after the age of 24. <coughs> but you know what? They are what I call working poor yeah. adults. Yeah. They still struggle to uh, qualify for financial aid. Yeah. Most of it is almost all in student loans. And so are you looking at more Pell Grant work study options that were available probably to us when we were going to college? Oh, yeah. And the other side of that is mm -hmm. about the fact that um, now kids are considered independent from their parents for financial aid at the age of 24, not at 18. Right. So um, let me answer that a bunch of ways. So, um, uh, absolutely focused on the Pell Grant issue, just because I think that's when, when if, if you think back to that chart that I showed that showed tuition skyrocketing and Pell Grants flat, that is I think many very significant contributor to student debt, right? Because the federal government is providing substantially less support in the way of grants, um, and so the Pell Grant bill focuses on trying to restore the purchasing power of the Pell. It actually provides some additional assistance to students that are very poor. Um, and uh, 
It also makes some other changes, including, for example, right now if you use it for non, if you use your Pell Grant for non, um, non-tuition costs, so like for bottom or transportation, that's considered taxable income. That also seems kind of stupid. So we have a provision that would change that. Um, so that's the Pell Grant bucket. We're also doing some work focusing on uh, student loans. Um, personally, I think that the um, co-sponsor bill that says student loans, you should be able to refinance student loans, just like you can refinance other types of debt. Um, frankly, I also believe that you should, students should be able to borrow at the same low interest rates that Wall Street banks can borrow at. Um, so that's, uh, I think, some of the action on, and, and I will tell you, Congress, to some, to, you know, I guess to its credit, took some action last year because if Congress had failed to act, we would have seen a doubling of the interest rate on student loans last year. And because Congress actually took action, that didn't happen, and that's good news. And the third thing, um, I'll mention one and a half more things. Um, you mentioned work study. So, you know, I, listen, I could, my folks were school teachers, so I couldn't have gone to college without all of this stuff, right? I got grants, and I got loans, and I washed dishes in the college dining room, which my wife believes is the only transferable skill I learned in college. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, um, uh, but our state does something cool with regard to work study that I actually think the federal work study program should look at. And that is, what it does is it says, we're going to provide one rate of, of work study support if you are cheap labor for your college, and we're going to provide a better rate for work study if you get placed in a job in a placement that could lead to a long-term job. So you're actually developing a skill, you know, so so you're learning a job skill that might help you later on in life, um, not just providing the cheap labor to your institution of higher education. And so we're um, we're currently working with a number of my colleagues on legislation that would kind of go that direction. I mentioned um, uh, I made three and a half points. The half point is I'm spending a lot of time, and I value your, if anyone has thoughts on this. How, how do we get? Uh, how do we pump the brakes on tuition increases? And what you've seen in our state, and frankly in state after state, is when the economy dips, um, state after state uses higher education as its rainy day fund. So it cuts the bejeebers, to use a legislative technical term, out of higher education and then jacks up tuition, substantial, and that contributes to student debt. And so one of the things that I've been thinking through, and I've, we've started having some conversations with like the State Board of Community Technical Colleges and some of our like, local co uh, college leaders, I should mention Doug Sand in the back who was on the board of Olympic College and um, that was an uh, awesome leader in the legislature thinking about these things. The, the question is, could you do something perhaps with Pell, with Pell Grants where you said, let's try to incent states to pump the brakes on tuition increases and maybe sweeten the Pell pot for students who go to those schools that aren't jacking up tuition. And because it's kind of a free market in terms of where a student goes, maybe that would reward those schools that are pumping the brakes on tuition increases. Again, I'm telling you something where I haven't, we haven't fully fleshed out the idea, which is always dangerous, um, but uh, it gives you a sense of how I'm thinking about it. Yeah, I saw you had a hand up. Was your well, I was on something else, but yeah. <laughs> since you're talking about this, let's say someone were to come along and say that they were going to get free education to everyone. Mm -hmm. Now, and then, personally, I think that's a great idea. But I also know it's a complicated process and a lengthy process and that never took time. Yeah. So in that context, the things that you're dealing with, like Pell Grants, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, would those things change or would they be folded into something like that? Sure. Um, that's a good question. And you know, the president in the State of the Union last year proposed um, making a community college for you. So basically doing moving from a K-12 world to a K-14 world. And listen, again, with good reason, because while not every job is going to require a post-secondary education, if you look at the Department of Labor's statistics, I think 19 of the 20 fastest growing jobs are at least going to require some post-secondary education. And so making sure that, again, I look at 
Uh, I look at uh, education as sort of the door of economic opportunity, and financial aid for a lot of families, including mine, is the key to that door, right? How do we make sure that door's open for everybody? Um, and so I, I was supportive of the President's proposal to do that. I will tell you we did not have much in the way of traction in Congress. And as a consequence, that's where you start going, okay, well, what else, if that's not going to move, what else can we do, right? What other levers can we pull? And that leads you to, okay, how do we put Pell Grants on steroids? And how do we deal with student loans? And how do we look at changes to work study that may have more um, feasibility in the current congressional climate. Yeah, that was a diplomatic way of saying things, wasn't it? Um, yeah. Um, I have two questions, and just two things that help me. Sure. Like you said, everything you do is important, I know. But for us, small businesses, you know, small businesses is 33 years old. Yeah. And every year, for the last, I would say the last five years, it becomes more challenging to be able to write that tax check. Sure. Um, Small businesses getting squeezed really hard. Yeah. And so that's very challenging. So I, I hope you work hard at that too. You the other thing I want you to work hard at is stormwater. Um, I work as a port of Allen commissioner. Right. Um, we had a project in Allen uh, that addressed what we were doing. And the only reason I was on board with the project is because they were going to address some stormwater issues. Yeah. The North Bay is all, the Oyster Bay is all. Absolutely. And so I was on board with that. Well, when the project um, got done, unbeknownst to me, Washdot told the court we didn't have to address stormwater, so we didn't. So when the project was done, that was in December, and we had all our rain in December, there was huge runoff issues. Yeah. And guess what? We had to address that. So I hope that whatever you yeah. do nationally also comes back for our state agencies you bet. and follows your own. Yeah, so the, um, I appreciate both questions. The, um, and I, I think I gave you some sense of the levers I wanted to see pulled on, on the small business side. So let me talk a little bit more about this stormwater bill. We're going to be introducing two bills. Um, one is focused on um, kind of municipal and uh, the, the vast, vast majority of stormwater problems come off of streets, off of roads. And um, it's a massive contributor to some of our challenges with Puget Sound. I joined along with our neighboring congressman, Denny Heck, in creating something called the Puget Sound Recovery Caucus that's designed to try to protect Puget Sound, which is not only important from an environmental ethic, it's important economically, because as you point out, there's a bunch of industries that are tied into the health of, of, uh, of our water. And um, so we're going to be pushing as part of that agenda uh, a stormwater bill that provides additional resources and it's using existing funds but it's trying to carve out some of those existing funds for green stormwater infrastructure to encourage some of this investment by local communities in addressing their stormwater challenges. And, and listen, there's, um, I was up at, uh, at the Washington State University campus in, in Puyallup where they have a stormwater research center and they showed video of the effect of stormwater on salmon and it was it was really upsetting because I mean, you, they get exposed to, you know, interestingly, coming off of our roads is chemicals that you could probably find, you could certainly find in your automobile, you could probably find in the chem lab up at the high school. Um, and it has an immediate negative effect and, and leads to very substantial fish kills. And at a time where already our fisheries are very challenged, um, we ought to work on that. The other bill is going to be focused on um, providing some resources to private landowners, to, uh, to industry, and to homeowners to be able to address stormwater challenges because they contribute as well. But right now, there's not what's your incentive if you're a business owner other than the threat of litigation to address your stormwater challenges. I'd much rather see the federal government use a carrot rather than a stick. Yeah. Um, yeah, I'd like to address something that we haven't really talked about, but yeah. I was shocked when you were oh, yeah. I, is it new word? Yeah, you got it. It worked. <laughs> uh, I was shocked a number of years ago to learn that less than 1% of our total federal budget goes to foreign aid. Yeah. And, uh, and then I see the poll, our poll shows that the typical American uh, thinks uh, that we give about 25% of our total federal budget to foreign aid. I don't know if they even know the story. But I'm curious. What do your colleagues think, especially the ones on the other 
side of the aisle. I mean, do, do they are they aware of the small fiscal piece that we give to the party? Yeah, I appreciate the question. Um, I, I, it's always hard to paint what Congress thinks with too broad a brush because there's um, there's a diversity of opinion in, in, in Congress. I'll put it that way. Um, here's the reality, though. Uh, Foreign assistance is actually a pretty critical part of our foreign policy toolbox. The State Department talks about this through what they refer to as smart power. The notion that you need to have a strong military because there are threats that exist, but that there are other tools in our foreign policy toolbox. Diplomacy, obviously, is a big tool. The ability to actually engage other countries and talk to each other. Economic tools are also very important because and whether that be sanctions, as you just saw last week, Congress passed another round of sanctions against North Korea. Um, uh, trade can sometimes be part of that foreign policy toolbox. Um, and as you point out, foreign assistance is, is part of that as well. It was in Afghanistan about two years ago. And we met with the Afghan um, National Security Forces. We had a really good their defense ministry. And we had very interesting conversations. And at the end of one of the meetings um, with the defense ministry, the uh, Afghan uh, defense official said, you know what you don't, he said, you know, you guys have done, the American government has done a very good job of training our military. And as a consequence, when you all leave, hopefully we'll be in a better position to defend ourselves. And he said, what you don't get enough credit for is the fact that the educated population of Afghanistan has increased substantially as a consequence of foreign aid through, um, through the commitment of the federal government. And he said, he said, our belief is that when you educate people, you give them economic opportunity. And when they have economic opportunity, they're much less likely to strap, strap a bomb in their back and blow a bunch of people up. And uh, that's long been something that Democrats and Republicans have uh, appreciated. I visited a USAID site in an area, uh, sorry, the Agency for uh, International Development um, site in an in a, uh, area where there are 2,500 people who live with no toilets. They have a defecated public, and there's huge public health consequences of that. And one of the USAID uh, commitments was building toilets and the capacity to prevent massive public health outbreaks that don't know borders, by the way, right? I mean, we've seen this with Zika and all this other stuff. The potential of a public health outbreak to make its way to our shores can be substantial as well. And so those are the types of investments that we look at when we talk about foreign aid. It's things like trying to prevent public health outbreak and trying to ensure that people are less likely to be motivated to commit acts of terror. I think those are smart investments. And I would say that a majority of Congress supports that. Not everybody, but a majority. Any other questions? Yeah. I'd like to talk a little bit about funding for the National Park. Yeah. Um, one of the barriers to getting to the National Park um, that the entrance that's closest to us, the staircase entrance, is that the road is horrible. Yeah. It's a Forest Service road, and the Forest Service won't maintain it. Mm -hmm. And because it's a Forest Service road, nobody else will. Yeah. It's probably not your bailiwick, but it doesn't yeah, seem to be anybody's. Yeah. So um, there's two challenges there. And, and I'll talk about both. Um, the National Park, so interesting, we're in the centennial of the National Park System, it's 100 years. In fact, I just, when the President delivered his final State of the Union, I invited Sarah Kreechbaum, who's the superintendent of the park, as my guest, just to highlight the importance of the National Park System in our area. Not just as a, I mean, it's cool for people who live here, but it's awesome in terms of attracting tourists who come here and spend their money and then leave. Um, it's also, and we welcome them in all of those steps. Um, but it's also a really big supporter of local businesses, hotels and restaurants. My grandfather paved roads in Port Angeles and actually paved part of the road at Hurricane Ridge. Um, and so the park is a substantial contributor to our local economy. And in recent years, it's really been hamstrung 
uh, as, a, as a consequence of congressional <coughs> budget dysfunction. They were very negatively impacted by the policy known as sequestration. How many of you have heard of sequestration? I confess I hadn't heard of it until I ran for Congress. I looked it up. It's a Latin word um, for stupid. Um, <laughs> and I say that largely because it involves very deep uh, across the board cuts. And it has, it's really hamstrung the ability of, of our, not just our local park, but the park, park system broadly to do the type of maintenance and service to visitors that you would expect every park, park system, particularly in a time of year. So the good news is you actually saw in the budget agreement that passed and the spending bill that passed in December some additional funding put towards the park service. And when I asked Sarah, so how does that affect you? She said, well, I've got positions that I can have hired for to deal with some of this, some of this maintenance backlog. Um, so that's good news. Um, you mentioned that it's a forest service road. This also gets into the conversation not just around sequestration, but it gets to another issue that negatively impacts the Forest Service, and that's the practice known as fire borrowing. And I'm not I'm not trying not to get too wonky here, but part of the problem is the Forest Service gets gets its funding in pots of money. And the Congress consistently puts, you know, here's a pot of money for um, for road maintenance, and here's a pot of money for uh, fire prevention, and here's a pot of money for fire fighting, and here's a pot of money to go prepare timber sales so we can actually support our local mills. And unfortunately, what's happened year after year after year is that that fire fighting pot gets completely consumed really quickly, and the Forest Service's current only avenue is to go raid all of those other pots of money, including for road maintenance including to prepare timber sales. And frankly, you know, and the problem with that is it also means that we're not adequately managing our forests, which means you're more likely to have more forest fires. So we're chasing our tail. I mean, it's a really negative practice. And so I've sponsored a bill that says, let's stop that. Let's stop that practice of fire bar. I'm going to acknowledge that particularly, you know, since we've seen most of, in recent years, most of the fires have um, been, including the one in the National Park, was caused by a lightning that struck a tree and then burned up a whole bunch of acres. Let's treat these forest fires as what they are, which is a natural, a natural disaster. And in every other natural disaster, you can see support from the Federal Emergency Management Agency, or FEMA, rather than having it come completely at the expense of the Forest Service, which has a negative impact on roads and everything else under the status quo. Interestingly enough, that's a Republican bill. That's a Mike Simpson from Idaho bill as broad bipartisan support, and if we ever got a chance to vote on it, it would pass in a heartbeat, and unfortunately, it's just gotten jammed up in the work. But that is exactly the type of thing. When I talk about the need to make bipartisan progress on the thing, at least let's make progress on the things we can agree on, right? We can sit and argue about the things we disagree on, but that's the type of thing where I, I, I do not understand, and it's always hard for me to explain the inexplicable. Um, I do not understand why you haven't seen Congress take action on that. Well, Sorry, I got, let me get to the people who haven't asked questions in the phone. I asked one already, so. All right, is there anyone who didn't get a question in that wants to, and then I'll start going for round two. All right. Oh, go ahead. Um, what would it take to get a constitutional amendment to overthrow the Civil United, and how would you go about it? Sure, the question was, um, how would we overturn the Citizens United decision? Um, and there's a few ways that you could see that brought up. One, it's a court case, and you could see, uh, you very well might see a reconstitution of the United States Supreme Court and have them take up uh, that issue again. Um, so that's one avenue through which it could be changed. Second is through Congress taking action on the bill that I've sponsored, that is a uh, constitutional amendment to undo that decision and to make explicit the, um, uh, a few things. One, that, that corporations don't have the rights of people or personhood. Um, and secondly, that Congress should have some ability to um, regulate campaign finance rules, whether that be um, around, because part of the concern around the decision was not just that it opened up the dollar floodgates, but it also put into question whether Congress can even establish contribution limits and whether or not it can require disclosure 
Um, and that, I think, is a real concern, particularly as you've seen all of this dark money flood into our political system. And it means you see ads that are paid for by the super PACs, and you have no idea who's paying for them. You have no idea who the dollars are behind it. And you, you have the potential, and one of my concerns, and this is something else we're working on, is you have no idea whether these are even Americans that are contributing to try to influence our elections. It's quite possible you could see outside, because there's no disclosure, we have no idea where this money is coming from, and I think that is a real concern. You will likely see an initiative on the ballot in our state um, and in several states, um, and if enough states pass an initiative demanding that Congress take action on a constitutional amendment, um, that's another avenue through which you can see action. I can't remember exactly how many of the states have to do it. I can get your information and we can give you the here's how they, here are the various avenues to constitutional change. You have a question? Well, this is it's kind of a strange question. Uh, my libertarian and conservative friends turn pale and lose sleep when they begin talking about the national debt. And uh, I think they have a very good point. I'm just kind of wondering what's in your mind when we appropriate money, all our pressing presently, sure. the infrastructure, the education, it goes on and on. But this number looming out there in the, in the near future, yeah. how are we going to do both? But, uh, without keeping us here till midnight. Sure. Um, no, we're all leaving at 6.30, so <laughs> <laughs> don't worry. Um, uh, so, um, so I actually think that the national debt's a problem. And I say that in part because I'm a dad, and I'm worried about the fact that as my kids grow older, that more and more of their paycheck is going to go into paying off their credit card bills that our generations have racked up. And um, the reality is, as you look at every think tank and bipartisan commission and nonpartisan commission that has looked at our debt problem, they've all pretty much concluded the same thing. And that is, one, that it's a problem. Um, including you know, the fact that a lot of the do dollars that we're borrowing aren't always from people who share our interests. And two, um, that this problem is too big simply to cut your way out of it, simply to tax your way out of it, or simply to depend on economic growth as a strategy out of it. Rather, you have to look comprehensively at a comprehensive solution to dealing with our debt challenge. And, um, and I'll tell you, so I mentioned that I'm part of this bipartisan group. And so we got together, and for six weeks in a row, we brought in a group called Fix the Debt that have this monstrous spreadsheet that you can find on their website of literally, I mean, almost every avenue you can think of to address debt on both sides of the ledger. And we went through it um, in painstaking detail. And what we decided to do was um, we color-coded the spreadsheet. We said, if this is low-hanging fruit, let's color it crude. If this is something that, if there were a big, bold, bipartisan budget deal, um, that you'd kind of have to hold your nose to agree, if one side or the other would have to hold their nose to agree on, we color it in yellow. But it was something that we would say, well, I could, I could go for this if I got something, on, something that I wanted, right? And then something that was completely a non-starter, we colored it. And what I'll tell you is, interestingly enough, if you add up the green and the yellow, there's actually quite a bit you could do. And, and I'll give you an example. Um, I'll give you an example on the cut side. I, I think I talked already briefly about my belief that we need to have broader tax reform that puts our nation in a more competitive situation. And we, again, we have tax breaks that really don't make sense. I have yet to be in a room when I ask how many of you are importers of Chinese ceiling fans where anyone raises their hand, um, and yet if you did, congratulations, you get a really large tax break under the United States tax code. That's crazy, right? That doesn't make sense. That is not job or revenue generated for the United States of America. On the cut side, um, as part of the bipartisan working group, we had in um, a guy from uh, the Government Accountability Office, the GAO, and he said, <clears throat> he presented this report that the GAO does every year. And it's on waste and inefficiency and duplication within the federal government. And some of it's just crazy train stuff. It's, you know, there are three different federal agencies that do inspections of catfish. And there's, I think, 54 different contracted entities that do translation services for the Department of Defense. I mean, things that just, as a 
forget about it as a representative, as a taxpayer, I would even say, that's, that doesn't make sense. So we had this guy do the presentation, and then one of my colleagues said, so I just, I'm curious, what happens with your report? And the guy said, well, more often than not, we file our report, and nothing happens with our report. And our reaction was, well, that seems silly, right? Like, we, this is low-hanging fruit, right? This is stuff that you could do tomorrow and save American taxpayers' money. And so the proposal that we made, and we've now introduced it as a bipartisan bill, is let's take that report that the Government Accountability Office does every year and force a congressional vote on the recommendations. Let's treat it like the, BRAC, the Base Closure Commission, the BRAC Commission, the Great Base Realignment Closure Commission. When well, the Base Closure Commission makes a, its recommendation, Congress is required to take an up or down vote on it. Let's treat that Government Accountability Office report exactly the same way. Let's force an up or down vote on those recommendations and at least make sure that it's not a report that's done every year that ends up sitting on a shelf collecting dust. Right? That, and that is something that was introduced coming out of that bipartisan working group because we had breakfast together. And so... Um, so where's the bill? Is it sitting on the it's now, so it's now. So we introduced it and it's, it's gotten bipartisan support. We're pushing for a hearing. I mean, then part of the challenge is Congress is not exactly a legislative juggernaut. Um, and, uh, uh, but we're pushing it. And thankfully, we're pushing it in a bipartisan way. And so I, I, I give that example because I think it's indicative of the things that we can get done if we actually say, okay, let's get focused on the stuff that actually matters. 